I'm Chris Sims. And I'm Franco Terrazano. This is the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. We're dedicated to lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. In this episode, we'll take a deep dive into the situation in Atlantic Canada. They have a huge tax disadvantage there. So we're going to speak with our Atlantic Director, Paige McPherson, about that. And in Waste Watch, we'll tell you how Minister Catherine McKenna blew more of your money taking pictures of herself, this time at the United Nations. But first, we just saw one of the quickest trial balloon poppings in Canadian political history. The old zombie idea of capital gains tax on the sale of your primary home came back to life. And it was quickly slain. Well, at least for now. The story broke last week with a report by the investigative journalism site Black Box Reporter. The Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, also known as the CMHC, is spending a quarter of a million dollars on a research project. And that project is looking at whether Canadians should pay a capital gains tax on the sale of their primary homes. Yep, that's the ones that they're living in right now. Yeah, and that's really the nest egg for lots of people. They're going to depend on that money for their financial futures. So just after that story broke, the Taxpayers Federation, we put out a petition against this huge tax grab, and we started doing interviews on it right away. People were furious that they would be taxed on the sales of their homes, and the response was huge. We were getting emails and phone calls, and you can bet members of Parliament were getting them too. The story first broke Friday night, and by Saturday morning, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's cabinet was denying it. Here's a tweet from Liberal Cabinet Minister Ahmed Hussein, and I quote, The government of Canada is not looking at charging capital gains on primary residences. This is not under consideration by our government. Any suggestion otherwise is false, end quote. Oh boy, they were skating backwards from this one faster than Paul Coffey. I'm impressed you know who Paul Coffey is. Of course. I mean, he's one of the uh, old-time Oilers. He's one of the greats. (laughs) Old-time. Yeah, I walked into that one. So after a furious weekend of pushback from homeowners here in Canada, Finance Minister Bill Morneau told the House of Commons that the Trudeau government is not putting a capital gains tax on the sale of primary homes. Here he is in question period. I want to thank the member for that question. I want to be very clear. This is not something that this government is considering. We are not looking at tax changes on principal residences. That is not something that we're looking into, and we will not be considering that in the future. Thank you for that. The CMHC was also distancing itself at warp speed from this report. They even called the Black Lock story horrible reporting. Hey, catch is... We've seen the documents that Blacklock's used, and they have the story straight. And you know, the group that was spearheading the research project, they're known as Generation Squeeze, and they repeatedly considered taxing the sale of primary homes. Generation Squeeze thinks not taxing principal residences is a nearly $7 billion cost for governments because home sales are currently not taxed. This is a quote from their 2018 report. Here it is. Capital gains earned from the sale of primary residences in Canada are not counted as income for tax purposes. The federal government reports this tax expenditure costs nearly $7 billion annually, along with corresponding reductions to provincial coffers, end quote. Well, it sounds to me like they think everything should automatically be taxed and belongs to the government. It's like a form of reverse billing. And, you know, this isn't the first time that this idea has been floated. Last September, you might remember, the Conservative Party got a hold of a Liberal Party memo, and it mused about putting a capital gains tax on homes. But the idea was quickly shot down as soon as voters spotted it during the last election. Here's the thing. The federal government will soon be a trillion dollars in debt. That's a one with 12 zeros after it. It's mind-boggling. The government should be focusing on cutting spending, not reaching further into our pockets with new taxes. And here's another thing. You know, they can spend money researching this stuff and then get mad and lash out at a journalist when it actually gets reported. Yeah, they can do that if they want. But if they aren't planning on taxing our primary home sales, and this is all smoke and no fire, well, then why did the Trudeau government change the tax reporting rules? If we sell our homes now, we need to tell Revenue Canada about it, and we need to tell them how much we made on it. So why is that? Exactly. If they're not going to tax you on it, why are they asking? Are they just curious? Are they writing a book? 
taxpayers should be suspicious. They should also remember that when John Cretchen's liberals promised to scrap Brian Mulroney's GST, they didn't do it. They should also remember when Dalton McGuinty in Ontario, he promised that he wouldn't raise taxes, but then he jacked up health care taxes right after the election and called them fees instead. So these politicians can say that they aren't eyeing our homes as tax revenue piggy banks to be smashed, but we're watching them. And we need to keep watching them closely. If our listeners are concerned about this, they should head to our website and sign the petition against this new home tax. And you can find that petition and keep up to date on this issue by visiting taxpayer.com. Coming up next, I'm going to take a deep dive into the Atlantic provinces and the huge tax disadvantage they have when compared to their neighbors. We're going to do that with our Atlantic director, Paige McPherson. Stay with us. It's time for our deep dive. This is when we get deeper into important issues. Now, every province has shifted to some extent to reopening the economy. The Atlantic provinces are no exception. But as many businesses are struggling to get started up again, Atlantic Canada is at a major disadvantage, making that recovery even tougher. Here at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we released a report digging into that tax disadvantage. Our Atlantic director, Paige McPherson, is here with us, and she co-authored the report. Paige, it's awesome to have you on the show. Can you take us for a dive into those numbers? Hey, Chris. Absolutely. So as you know well, Atlantic Canada is a wonderful region in so many ways. It's a wonderful place to live, but we need to get the economy going here, and we've got a big problem. And part of that big problem is the tax rates. We've got some of the highest income tax rates on individuals, while taxes in the neighboring New England states are much lower, in some cases even zero. We also have some of the highest sales taxes. And again, for parts of New England, the sales tax rate is zero. And for entrepreneurs, you know, job creators, picking a place to get started, Atlantic Canada's business taxes are twice as high as many of New England's rates. So when you stack up our sky high rates, against New England's zeros and half off rates right next door, well, we have a hard go from a competitiveness point of view. You know, when you put it that way, it sounds like entrepreneurs and even individuals are trying to keep up with the competition while they've got a backpack full of rocks. So tell us how these taxes are holding Atlantic Canada back. Well, it really comes down to a simple question, right? Are we competing on a level playing field? Would a business owner be able to set up shop in an Atlantic Canadian province and generate similar revenue and hire the same amount of workers for the same level of investment? Could an individual taxpayer buy a home and start a family without having the provincial government take significantly more from them? The numbers showed us that by almost every measure, the costs imposed by government are higher here in Atlantic Canada than they are in New England, sometimes by almost double on average. Double. That's a huge problem. It is. It's an issue because the long-term success of our region really depends on investment into our provinces. You know, it depends on the ability for people to start businesses here and thrive. Um, You know, it depends on people staying here in the region and just as importantly, moving back home to the region as well. In Atlantic Canada, we we really need to turn the tide of out-migration. And the high costs imposed by government compared to the other places that businesses could set up shop and the other places that people can leave to to go find work, just they just make that a big challenge. They really do. I remember seeing that a lot when I lived and worked in Nova Scotia. So many people leaving to go find work. And there was really a similar situation in Saskatchewan. They had issues for quite a while with people heading out to Alberta to go get work. But reducing their taxes helped solve that problem. Yeah, so actually Saskatchewan is a really great case study for Atlantic Canada because the issues are similar in terms of the out-migration, people leaving to go find work, as you say, and they're both relatively rural regions of the country as well. Um, They also both happen to have some of the (laughs) friendliest people going, if you ask me. They do, but just maybe not at tax time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes, that is not when you will find us at our happiest here. 
For sure. So some of our listeners might be familiar with one of our annual gas tax honesty day events. Uh, that's when we're standing next to gas pumps and we're pointing out how many taxes you're paying. And we put out a report along with that every year. And our last report showed that Atlantic Canada has higher gas taxes than our New England neighbors, and that helps drive up the pump prices. So is this new report basically showing the same thing, but with other taxes too? Yeah, that's exactly it. So income taxes are are one example. Um, Our report found that state personal income tax rates in New England are mostly lower than provincial tax rates in Atlantic Canada. So in 2019, the lowest income tax bracket in the Atlantic provinces was 8.7% in Newfoundland and Labrador. The lowest in New England, however, was 0%. Zero? Yes, 0% in New Hampshire. And the highest provincial income tax bracket overall was 21%, which is where I live in Nova Scotia. And the highest in New England um, was only 8.5% in Vermont. You can definitely see the problem when you lay out the numbers that way. Yeah, absolutely. There's a big difference in those rates. And our new 33% personal income tax bracket that was added um, at the federal level, added by Ottawa in 2016, really only worsened the situation. It worsened Atlantic Canadians' tax advantage with our New England neighbors. Okay, so the provincial versus state personal income taxes are higher. When you work, your government takes more of your money in Atlantic Canada. But what about when you go out and buy stuff? Yeah, so sales taxes. Sales taxes are higher here too. Um, In Atlantic Canada, every province has a 15% sales tax rate combined, federal and provincial. So Ottawa takes 5%, which means that the provincial sales taxes here are all 10%. Um, That's the highest in Canada, but it's also the highest uh, or higher than any other New England state. Um, New England sales taxes range from a high of 7% in Rhode Island to 0% in New Hampshire. Man, New Hampshire again with the 0% tax. Live free or die indeed. (laughs) I know. They seem to be doing something right. Seriously. Okay, there must be some tax looked at in this report that's lower in Atlantic Canada. Did you find one? (laughs) Yes, there was one tax. Um, Atlantic Province's small business taxes were either less than or on par with the New England states. So our small business taxes range from 2.5% to 3.5%. So that's lower than the rates in New England, uh, in the New England states, except for Maine, which is on par. But Maine is the state right on the border, right? That's right. So the one that's on par is actually the one that we're in the closest direct competition with. Uh, So that's unfortunate in terms of how the tax rates shook out. Um, But I think it's just more incentive for the Atlantic provinces to lower our taxes and start focusing on being more competitive with our neighboring jurisdictions. So based on this, is it actually cheaper to start a business in Atlantic Canada than in the New England states then? Well, no, not exactly, especially not if you'd like your business to grow. So if you exceed that small business tax rate, the main business tax rate uh, in New England is about half the standard rate in Atlantic Canada. So, yeah, so New England's business taxes range from 6% to 8.93%, while Atlantic Canada's business taxes range from 14% in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia to 15% in Newfoundland and Labrador, and 16% in PEI. Whoa, so New England's are about half? That means that Atlantic Canada's general business taxes are about double? That's right. Wow. Okay, we're talking about some big differences here in some of these cases. But didn't Nova Scotia just lower its business tax? Yes, um, so they did, and that was excellent to see. So the, the Nova Scotia government, Nova Scotia Premier Stephen McNeil, lowered the business tax from 16% down to 14% this spring. He also lowered the small business tax by half a point. So we went from the highest general business income tax rate in Canada to among the (laughs) highest business tax rates in Canada. Well, that's good, but it's still not exactly a competitive jurisdiction from that point of view. Yeah, that's right. So it was a great step forward for sure, but we have a, a much longer way to go. So does the timing of our economic shutdowns that's happening right now, does that affect your recommendations to lower taxes at all? Well, I think that just as we're, you know, we're hoping to get our economies chugging back up at full steam now. And just as this is happening, these high taxes just make us uncompetitive. So it really adds to the challenge that we're already facing. Um, You know, the pandemic has increased challenges for, for basically everybody in all aspects of public policy, obviously. But I'd say that now more than ever, we need to be creative and bold with our economic recovery and with the policies that support that. 
Right. So a lot of governments turn to corporate welfare to encourage business growth. You say lowering taxes is a better solution. Can you explain why? Yeah, so Atlantic Canada is, is really no exception to the corporate welfare addiction that we have right across Canada, that's for sure. Um, governments picking winners and losers with taxpayer dollars is par for the course. And yes, sometimes the recipients are even golf courses, so I <laughs> use that wording intentionally. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but high taxes and corporate welfare, they just don't send a strong positive signal to potential job creators, and I'll explain why. So it tells them, you know, we're going to take a lot of your money. We're going to give some of that money to corporations that we decide that we like at that time. And then we're going to repeat that process over and over again. Sure, you may be one of the businesses that gets the cash one of those times, but the next time you may not be. But every time we're going to keep taking a lot of your money. So then can you explain how lowering taxes is different from that situation? Well, of course, no tax reduction is ever permanent. And that's, you know, why groups like ours exist. Groups like the Canadian Taxpayers Federation need to stay vigilant in holding governments accountable. But it's a lot harder politically for a politician to raise your taxes than it is to dish out or take away a a corporate welfare grant. So lowering taxes sends a much stronger, much more permanent symbol to job creators. You know, it says come here and create jobs in a lower cost environment. And it it just levels the playing field, I think, for all businesses without picking winners and losers. That makes sense. So is there anything else the report recommends Atlantic governments do to turn the tide, as you say? Yeah, so so we're calling on the provincial governments in each of the Atlantic provinces to reduce their spending where possible, because of course, this is a necessary step to create room for tax relief. We've also called on Atlantic provincial governments to allow for further resource exploration and development to create jobs. But most of all, we'd really like to see business and personal taxes go down in this region. And I think our report really shows that we have a lot of work to do in this area. You know, this is what we're all about at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Governments so often need to be reminded that people work very hard for their money. They work hard to better their provinces, and they want to create these jobs. But government's high taxes can make this so much tougher. Chris, that's exactly right. Listeners can go to our website at taxpayer.com, and they can read the full report there, and they can see for themselves how the numbers stack up. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, President of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Sorry for interrupting the podcast, but I wanted to take a few seconds of your time to tell you more about the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. We are 235,000 Canadians from coast to coast that are fed up. We are fed up with politicians taking too much out of our paychecks, often to waste it on a bunch of pet projects, corporate welfare, and pork barreling to buy votes. We organize campaigns to push back on these politicians. These campaigns often include petition drives, billboards, media stunts, and more. But most importantly, they ask our supporters to pitch in and take action. Alone, we're a voice in the wilderness. Together, we're an army to be reckoned with. You can join the fight and sign up at no cost at taxpayer.com. That website again is taxpayer.com. Okay, now back to the podcast. It's time for Waste Watch. This is when we make fun of the dumb things that governments are wasting your money on. Franco, what do you have for us today? Well, it looks like Liberal Cabinet Minister Catherine McKenna spent a bunch of money to have a photographer to follow her around and snap some photos again. You gotta be kidding, man. McKenna had this exact same problem back in 2016. There was a big media circus about it. You'd think she would have learned her lesson the first time around. Well, you know, Chris, lots of us do some dumb stuff, right? You know, I'm, I sure know that I've done some dumb stuff in the past. Like, I remember when we first started body checking in minor hockey. One of my first games, I kept crossing the blue line with my head down, looking at the puck. Well, a defenseman, he taught me a good lesson. He got me real good. My gloves went in one direction. My stick went in the other direction. Don Cherry calls that getting stuck in the trolley tracks. (laughs) Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, though. After that hit, I didn't get caught looking down at my skates anymore. Well, McKenna doesn't seem to have learned from her mistake. She got burned for spending way too much money on photographs in the past, 
And now the Canadian Taxpayers Federation has discovered that she spent a bunch on photos again, but this time during her visit to the United Nations. Yeah, our investigative reporter James Wood uh, dug this up. Uh, So how much did we all pay for McKenna's UN photos? The entire photography contract cost about 5,400 bucks, and it was for only three days of work. McKenna's photo spending was for one of those three days. That's a big waste of dough. I can think of a few things I'd rather see taxpayers' money go towards instead of vanity photos for a minister on a junket to New York. Uh, Maybe helping people who really need a hand up right now or cutting our huge debt load. These ministers, I will point out, They have communication staffers that are already paid. They're almost always going along with them to these visits. They should be the ones taking these photographs of their bosses doing grip and grins and typing and stuff. They should not be paying outside photographers. Where did these pictures even wind up? Are they on display? Now that's the $5,400 question. Well, seven photos were simply put on McKenna's Instagram account as a day in the life type of post. They show her busily typing, walking into the UN, schmoozing with diplomats, as I guess as you normally do if you're at the United Nations. And then they also show her speaking to counsel, and then a photo of her walking away. Magical. So we paid a truckload of money for her to show off on Instagram, basically. You know, when the Canadian Taxpayers Federation takes photos at events, it's usually the intern with the newest iPhone that's thrown at them that's then on duty. You know, even if we do spend some money on professional photos, it's maybe a couple hundred dollars. When I think of tax dollars being put to good use, I don't think of photos for a minister's Instagram account. No kidding. Uh, I think it's really important, too, to remember this is not the first time that McKenna has gotten into trouble for spending a ton of money on photos. Back in 2016, the media found out that McKenna and her staff had spent more than 17 grand. Back then, they spent more than $6,000 at a climate change summit in Paris, $3,200 at a sustainability conference out here in Vancouver, $1,300 for a meeting with the provincial environment ministers and $900 for a meeting with the head of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And these are just the amounts they spent on photos. And after McKenna got caught that first time with these big photo bills, this is what she had to say. And I quote, as someone who uses social media actively, personally, I think there are ways that we can reduce costs. We need to be mindful of the cost to taxpayers. You know, even Prime Minister Justin Trudeau acknowledged that McKenna's big photo tab was, quote, perhaps not the best use of public funds. Well, no kidding. And now we discover this new and big tab for photos in New York. Well, I don't think that's the best use of public funds either. Exactly. And I think a lot of us taxpayers and our listeners are getting sick and tired of these learning opportunities that these professional adults keep having on the job and on our dime. They should have known better before any of this happened. This is a stupid waste of money and they shouldn't do it. Thank you so much, Franco, for giving us a snapshot of yet more wasteful spending going on. If people want to know more about this case, check out the show notes or go to our website, taxpayer.com, to read the full story. Thanks for listening to the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. And thank you to James Wood for editing it. Please subscribe, like, share, and review our show. It really helps us get the word out to more people. And thanks again for listening. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, President of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. If you've got another minute, I'd like to ask you to think about the one person you know that would really enjoy listening to this podcast. Do us a favor and do them a favor and send them a quick note to let them know about it. At the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we believe there is power in numbers. That's why we've worked so hard to build an army of taxpayers who are ready to push back. And we did it because people like you shared our work with that one person that they knew would really appreciate taking part. Thanks for listening. And thanks for doing your part to make Canada a better place.